everyone. My name is Leah Sandals, Senior Editor at the Alzheimer's Society of Canada and moderator for today's conversation. It is my pleasure to welcome you to Let's Talk About Air Pollution and Dementia. This talk is presented by the Alzheimer's Society of Canada in conjunction and partnership with Brain Canada. You can find out more about both our organizations in the chat. Um, before we start the conversation, we just need to go over a few items. This session is being offered in English and in French. To select a language, just click on the interpretation button that's usually at the bottom of the screen and then choose the language you want. You'll also notice that poll questions occasionally pop up on screen throughout the session. Uh, the answers help us understand if we're meeting your needs, so please do provide feedback. This talk is being recorded and will be made available on our YouTube channel and website uh, by early next week if you want to revisit it or share with friends. And lastly, this is a conversation. The chat is open and is being moderated. Should you wish to introduce yourself or share any evidence-based resources or experience around this topic? And if you have questions for our panel, feel free to just uh, jot them into the Q&A box on Zoom. It's also interfaced at the bottom of your screen usually. We'll do our best to get all your questions answered, but if there are questions we can't answer live during our hour together, uh, our team will follow up uh, via email in the coming days to uh, make sure your questions get answered, provided that you've submitted it with your name that you registered with. Um, today, I am coming to you from land that is the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabek, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee and the Wendat peoples, and it's now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit and Métis people. I also acknowledge that the Toronto, where I live and work and where the Alzheimer's Society of Canada offices are, is covered by Treaty 13 with the Mississaugas of the Credit. We encourage you to learn more about Indigenous-led and co-led initiatives in dementia, including but not limited to the Native Women's Association of Canada's Dementia Tools, uh, the website of Anishinaabek Dementia Care, the website and resources for the Canadian Indigenous Cognitive Assessment, and dementia resources from the National Collaborating Centre for Indigenous Health, just to name a few of the really great initiatives that are happening in this area um, and that are Indigenous-led. We're dropping some links about those in the chat um, for you to use, share, support, and learn from as well as some, uh, we're also adding links about some Indigenous-led initiatives specific to pollution and climate change, which are cogent to today's talk. Um, it's now my pleasure to do a brief slide presentation that introduces air pollution and dementia topics. And after that uh, brief presentation, we will connect with um, our, uh, our panelists and introduce them and have a group conversation as well as public Q&A. So Dave, could you please, Dave is our tech person behind the scenes here, Dave, could you please advance the slides? So the number one thing, the reason we're doing this talk today is you know, air quality matters in brain health, um, whether you live with or without dementia. Um, but one of the pieces of data that's very well established is that international researchers indicated that exposure to air pollution in later life, so over the age of 65, raises relative dementia risk by an average of 10%. Uh, that may not seem like a lot, but the fact that so many people worldwide are exposed to air pollution at varying levels throughout our lifetimes um, is part of what uh, makes this extremely impactful. Next slide, please. And another important thing to keep in mind as we go through our conversation today and beyond as you learn about this topic and also learn about actions that we can take about it because there are actions we can take individually and collectively. Um, but one thing to, uh, to know is that some studies have shown that, uh, you know, different pollutants that are in the air have different impacts on our dementia and brain health risk. So some studies have shown that what's called fine particulate matter, sometimes called PM 2.5, especially from wood burning, might have more impact on dementia risk than other pollutants. Um, but equally, other studies show that high nitrogen dioxide can also raise risk. Um, so research is ongoing, but those are two, two that come up quite a bit in the research. Um, next slide, please, Dave. 
So in preparing for this, you know, I work for a Canadian organization. And so I wanted to also look at briefly what researchers in Canada have shown on this particular topic of dementia and air pollution lately. So in 2022, some researchers at Western University published a paper using global data, finding a link between that particle air pollution and the number of people developing dementia over a certain period of time. In 2020, uh, in a very Quebec-focused example, Université de Montréal researchers found a significant association between the onset of dementia and distance to major roads and distance to basically road pollution. Um, and in 2017, University, University of Toronto researchers using Ontario-based data found that uh, exposure to air pollution, even at relatively low levels, was associated with higher dementia occurrences. So again, we share this information um, because knowledge is power in part, and also because there are actions we can take to mitigate risk that we will talk about um, with our experts in a little bit. Um, next slide, please. Um, one question we get a lot on this topic when we talk about air pollution and the brain is, well, how does air pollution impact the brain? How does it create um, issues in dementia? Um, there are still a lot of researches going on about this. Uh, lots of mechanisms are uh, still being tested, but here are some ideas that have been put forward um, among others. So one is the idea that uh, air pollution causes vascular changes, that is changes affecting blood vessels in the brain that then lead to dementia. Another idea that's put forward by some researchers is that air pollution causes neuroinflammation. That is, it causes in some way the brain cells to become inflamed. Another proposal that's been put forward is that um, air pollution levels can, uh, especially intense air pollution can lead to mental health changes. That is mental and mood changes that then play into other aspects of dementia risk or other aspects of like thinking and brain function. Next slide, please. And as we go through, um, our tech team has been dropping links in the chat to the research that is uh, associated with these findings, just so you're aware. So, one really important thing, uh, I think, and that I know Amanda Jiang, one of our researchers here today, is quite expert in and we'll talk more about, likely, is that the impacts of air pollution, of course, are not equally distributed among everybody. You know, some people are exposed to more air pollution than others. For example, people who live in proximity to major roadways. Um, this can mean that the risk of that those people experience on their brain health and dementia is going to be collectively higher in some ways than other groups. Um, next slide, please. Um, so some Canadian research about this. Uh, in a study of seven Canadian cities, this is a, a study that came out August 2023, um, some Canadian researchers found that neighborhoods with a higher prevalence of low income and of Indigenous identity had significantly higher air pollution attributable, attributable mortality. So um, again, just I wanted to select that quote to highlight that uh, some groups are put at higher risk by air pollution or are more exposed to it uh, generally and that that impacts health. So health equity is a really important thing to think about around air pollution. And so are issues of environmental injustice and environmental racism. Um, next slide, please. Of course, one source of air pollution that's also been quite unequal this year, uh, that's been very much noticed in the media and in everyday lives, in my life here in Toronto as well, in my neighbors' lives, um, but across the country is wildfire smoke as air pollution. Um, I was curious about uh, the extent of the fires this year. So I looked it up and apparently there's around 18 million, almost 19 million hectares that have burnt of land this year in Canada, which is uh, more than twice the previous record that was available through the Canadian Interagency Forest Fire Centre. The previous record was around 7 million hectares. Um, so definitely this is a, perhaps an, a significant uh, source we're aware of and is very visible to us right now around air pollution. Next slide, please, Dave. Another thing to keep in mind, another reason we wanted to do this panel is that um, this is not a static situation right now. Um, around air pollution that we have. I mean, climate change and air quality are linked. So a study called Health in a Changing Climate uh, that came out a couple of years ago, or is actually last year from the federal government, 
um, indicates that a warmer climate will worsen air pollution in Canada. Uh, it's indicated that increasing wildfire smoke emissions are one of the most significant climate-related risks to air quality. And also, again, equity is a concern. Uh, uh, certain populations being put at higher risk is a concern. Some groups are at increased risk of health impacts related to air pollution. That includes uh, groups like children, seniors, Indigenous peoples, people with pre-existing health conditions. Um, and we'll talk more about some of those issues in a moment. Next slide, please. So um, we're also really fortunate here today to have a dementia care expert, Dr. Jennifer Bambo, she'll meet in a moment. Um, and she knows well and can speak to and has spoken about how the health of people already living with dementia and including that those people's brain health can be negatively impacted by wildfires, smoke and other air pollution and climate change events too. So I just wanted to highlight that because um, we talk a lot about air pollution and dementia risk of people who maybe don't already have dementia. It's also important for us to be aware as we work in the dementia space, um, the ways that air pollution impacts people who already have dementia, impacts their brain health, impacts other aspects of their health and impacts the dementia care networks that have been established around them. Uh, next slide, please. So some emerging research on how wildfire smoke impacts the brain. We're almost at the end of the presentation, thanks to your patients. Um, there's short-term and long-term impacts that some US studies have looked at this year. One found that exposure to that fine particulate matter in wildfire smoke could reduce attention in adults in just a few hours. Um, that does get recovered later when the smoke disappears, but an interesting finding around just how the smoke can affect the brain. Another study found that neuroinflammation could be triggered in the short term. Um, in the long term, they're finding, again, the uh, fine particulate matter, particularly generated by wildfires or agriculture, can be associated with greater rates of dementia. So that kind of reinforces that, uh, that risk that's already been established. But um, the more evidence we get towards that, the more, again, uh, there can be evidence for policy action or uh, individual and collective action. Next slide, please. So this is my last slide. Um, and we will, uh, this is just a brief introduction. Um, there are ways to mitigate risk associated with air pollution and dementia or air pollution and health. Some of these include masking, air filtration, policies to improve air quality and climate, uh, accessible daily air quality forecasts and more. Um, thank you so much for your patience with this brief presentation. Just wanted to provide some key jumping off points as we discuss this in greater depth together. So next slide, please, Dave. And thank you so much. All right, now it's my extreme pleasure to introduce our panelists for today, um, who all have much greater expertise on this topic than I do, and who I'm very grateful um, for their insights today. Um, first, I'm gonna welcome Dr. Ryan Allen, a professor at Simon Fraser University who researches environmental health, air pollution, and exposure assessment, among other topics. Welcome, Ryan. Next, we have Dr. Sandy Azab, Research Associate Academic at McMaster University, who currently has a vast fellowship, is called to investigate the effect of air pollution on cognitive scores and vascular brain injury. Welcome, Sandy. Uh, now we welcome Dr. Jennifer Baumbush, a, I mentioned earlier, a professor at UBC, who researches healthcare delivery with older adults. And she has presented recently for Alzheimer's Society of BC, on climate emergencies and people living with dementia. Thanks so much for being here today, Jennifer. Great to see you. And last but certainly not least, we're grateful to have here today, Dr. Amanda Jiang, who is an assistant professor at UBC as well, whose research includes developing better methods for assessing and addressing pollution and environmental injustice. Thanks so much for being here, Amanda. Hi. Um, so let's begin on our group conversation. Um, you know, this we've just briefly reviewed some research about air pollution and dementia and related topics. Uh, each of you brings really uh, interesting expertise and lenses to this topic. So my first question is, you know, what, given your particular research and practice, do you wish more people in Canada knew right now about air pollution and brain health? Um, Jennifer, would you be able to get us started, please? 
Absolutely. Thanks so much, Leah, for that fantastic introduction to the topic. So as Leah mentioned, my area of interest is more on um, how we respond to wildfires and air pollution, particularly around dementia care for people who are already affected by dementia. So what I wish people really understood was that the impact of these events um, on older people is disproportionately greater than on the general population. So we really need to keep older people and people affected by dementia at the center of planning when we're responding to wildfires and air pollution events. Some of the reasons, and Leah has touched on some other reasons in her presentation about why certain groups are disproportionately impacted. For older people, we see higher rates of respiratory and cardiovascular disease just in general in that older population. And older people are also known to have potentially in more inadequate housing. So if you're older and have lived in your home for decades, it's likely to be less prepared to protect you against the air quality outside than people who live in newer housing. So those are some individual and more group risk factors for older people. And then people affected by dementia in particular have an additional layer of complexity that can make it challenging to cope during these events. And so I'll just point out one issue that has been studied a bit in the research literature and that surround evacuations and that when we're thinking about evacuation planning we need to ensure that we're thinking about what are the needs what are the particular needs for people affected by dementia during these events and so that means that our evacuation centers should be set up to support people appropriately who might have different sensory needs or might have responsive behaviors that can be triggered by moving away from their home and their familiar spaces so for me that's really such a central core concept in planning is that recognizing that this is a special population that we do need to be thinking about when we're developing policies and programs and then implementing them uh, when these events occur. Thank you so much, Jennifer. Um, I appreciate that insight. That kind of links a bit to um, Amanda. I know your expertise is also partly around different populations being impacted differently. Um, by air pollution. Would you be able to tell us what your thoughts are on this question of what you wish more people in Canada knew around air pollution and, and health? Yeah, and I'll build on some of the points that Jennifer mentioned. Um, very, um, as, as you noted earlier, the impacts of air pollution are not equally or equitably distributed. So some are more exposed and some are also more susceptible to air pollution related health impacts once exposed. And these groups include low income, indigenous, black and other communities of color, older adults, children, and those with chronic health conditions and intersections of these different kinds of identity. Um, when we talk about differential exposure, it's both about where people live, work, learn and play. And um, it's proximity of those places to polluting sources like highways or heavy industry. Um, but as was just mentioned, it's also about the quality of the indoor environment, the quality of housing. Uh, does someone have access to air filtration systems or air cleaners? Is someone experiencing homelessness and um, doesn't have access to um, cleaner air indoors? And so um, these exposure disparities are really important and they also can overlap with existing health disparities. So for instance, the incidence of asthma, which we know is um, linked to socioeconomic inequalities. So if you have both exposure disparities and uh, these other health disparities, air pollution can really actually be magnifying uh, those inequalities. Thanks, Amanda. Um, yeah, sometimes I think about inequalities as being more um, I, 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 it's it's always new for me to learn about like the indoor air quality part and the quality of the buildings um, among other topics. So thank you. Um, Sandy, uh, what are your thoughts on this uh, question of, you know, what you wish more people in Canada knew around, especially as you're researching in particular vascular kind of uh, injury to the brain and air pollution? What do you wish more people in Canada knew about this topic? Yeah, I'll, I'll make maybe shift more to the literature and I'm really uh, learning from the panel as as we go and um, this is um, um, I think just knowing or acknowledging that Canada has maybe one of the uh, lowest um, we're very fortunate that it's one of the lowest uh, air pollution uh, levels in the world and yet Health Canada estimates around 15,000 premature death every year due to air pollution so just from kind of I would like people to know from a brief or overlook or summary on the literature that we have very good evidence on the association of air pollution with mortality 
with death and with cardiovascular um, uh, disease. So maybe around 25 years or so of research, but in terms of air pollution and, and cognitive function or, or brain health, it's really a y much younger uh, field of research. So maybe last decade or, or so. And, and Leah, you've pointed out on like the studies, um, uh, the Canadian studies we have so far, uh, and many or most are just looking at uh, dementia. So um, I think what I'm very uh, also happy about, I would like people to know that there is research ongoing now to, to study the preclinical uh, stages. So in generally healthy middle-aged Canadians, we're trying to look at uh, the associations of air pollution with cognitive scores with um, silent uh, vascular brain injury. So what, what do you see on the MRI? And so these are, of course, very costly. So um, um, research funding is also uh, an important point. Thanks, Sandy. So yeah, as, as you said, like around 15,000 deaths in Canada yearly are attributed to air pollution, um, which was a figure I wasn't aware of. Um, and even though the general air pollution levels here are very low uh, compared to other places worldwide. Um, and that it's good for me to know that research about particularly brain health and dementia is just fairly young compared to other kinds of health research on this. Um, Ryan, what are your thoughts on this? I know you've you, you you studied in some ways early on, especially places where you lived and wildfire smoke exposure. Um, but what are your yeah. thoughts on what more people in Canada should know generally about these topics? Yeah. Um, first of all, thank you for organizing this event and inviting me to participate. This is really, uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I agree really with everything that's been said. And in fact, I'll just kind of reinforce a couple of those points. I think uh, Sandy makes a really important point about those um, the effects at low levels. So I think there's a there's kind of a sense that air pollution is only a threat when it's high, when you can see the the forest fire smoke outside your window, for example. Um, but there's really growing evidence, a lot of it from Canadian studies actually, that that chronic long term exposure even to low levels of air pollution um, has effects in terms of risk on mortality, risk on cardiovascular outcomes. Um, less is known about brain related outcomes, um, but I would be surprised if if um, if if the brain effects were um, wildly different from what we see for for other outcomes. So I, I just want to reinforce that point. Um, another, um, you know, speaking of forest fires, another kind of myth, I guess, that I would like to uh, do away with is I hear a lot of times talking to people, they'll say things like, well, we evolved with we evolved with forest fires. Um, therefore, forest fire smoke isn't a threat or 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 forest fires are natural and therefore forest fire smoke is somehow less of a threat than um, more um, human generated sources of pollution. And that just really doesn't seem to be supported by the evidence. The evidence, uh, we know less about forest fires than we do about the health effects of pollution from other sources. But based on the evidence that we have, there's really no evidence to support this idea that air, that forest fire smoke is any less of a threat than um, pollution from other sources. Thanks, Ryan. That's that's a that's an interesting point I hadn't considered. Um, the idea of some kind of pollution being more natural and therefore safer um, needs to be uh, uh, <laughs> confronted <laughs> in terms of uh, actual evidence. Um, thank you all, and thank you, Jennifer, for your point around the need for people uh, with dementia to be really closely considered in, in air pollution research and also in air pollution planning, like air pollution crisis planning. Um, all really excellent. So thank you. Um, now I'll just move on to our second question. I mean, each of you has researched these or like related topics in quite a bit of depth for quite some time now. Um, I'm always interested in what experts have been surprised by lately. You know, what, what can even surprise an expert in this field? Um, so Amanda, I was wondering if you could get us started with like, uh, what have you learned lately, uh, that surprised you about this in this topic field? Uh, so you're going to hear more echoes and some points that people brought up earlier, but I, I am, um, there's more and more work that really emphasizes that there's no safe levels of air pollution. And this is true as we're learning more about the different mechanisms through which air pollution can have health impacts. And so to link to a point that Sandy brought up earlier, we're so lucky in Canada to have like quite good air quality in a global context, but the more that we learn about how there is no safe level of air pollution, the more that emphasizes that we really do need to address 
the disparities in air pollution exposure that are experienced within Canada, and also that we really do need to push for continual improvement. And so related to that, um, some recent research um, that I learned about, uh, and I'll share in the chat as well, has, has indicated that actually, um, historically, we have made progress on air quality through policy action, um, and that's really important, but that wildfires are now actually starting to erode some of those air quality gains that we've experienced through uh, regulation. Um, and so that really highlights, again, the importance of addressing, um, you know, wildfires as well as, as we're thinking about air pollution and air pollution impacts. Yeah, I can imagine that the events this year in particular were a surprise even to the extent of them could have been a surprise possibly to, like you said, folks who work in this field and have been encouraged by seeing general air pollution levels generally go down in Canada. Um, so that's that's a really important point um, that we need to consider how to how to manage that or reduce those levels as well. Um, uh, Ryan, do you, uh, do you want to go next on this as well? Um, in terms of like what has surprised you lately? Yeah, I'll mention a couple of things that continues to surprise me. One is just the enormous kind of public health impacts of air pollution. And this has been alluded to already. Um, um, I think Sandy mentioned the Health Canada estimate of like 15,000 deaths a year attributable to air pollution. Um, something like 7% of all deaths globally are attributable to air pollution. It's one of the leading contributors to death and disease around the world. Um, and that con I continue to be amazed by those numbers. Um, the other thing I'll, I'll point to is, is um, the, the um, diversity of health effects and systems in the body that we see affected by air pollution. When I got into this business as a graduate student, like 20 plus years ago, th there was still a lot, the thinking was still largely around air pollution as a threat to lung health. And of course, air pollution is a threat to lung health. But then we started to see more and more evidence of air pollution affecting cardiovascular health. And now that's pretty much a, a, a question that's been answered. There's very little doubt that it affects cardiovascular health. Um, really strong associations with, with pregnancy and fetal growth and um, gestational outcomes. And now, as, as is the topic of today's uh, webinar, um, growing evidence of effects on brain health, both, both in terms of early life brain development and then um, cognitive decline in later life. So, um, you know, I, I continue to be amazed. It seems like just about every outcome or every system in the body that we look at um, as a potential um, uh, target of air pollution, we end up seeing those associations. Um, and that, um, you know, there it, that's biologically plausible. That you know, biologically makes sense. And you mentioned in your introductory presentation, you mentioned mentioned some of the likely mechanisms in terms of of brain health. Um, so that makes sense biologically, but I just continue to be surprised at just how many systems in the body seem to be affected by air pollution. Okay, thank you for sharing that. Yeah, that's that's good to know that even, um, yeah, even it, the knowledge continues to evolve, uh, even within the specialists who do the research on this about the extent of the issue. Um, thank you. And Sandy, um, what are your thoughts? I think when when we chatted a few days ago, we talked a little bit about mechanisms and that research um, and how that's evolving. Yeah, and like, yeah, what's coming up there that's surprising. And I can pick up on what Ryan's is um, saying. So um, like part of the research we're doing is in a um, um, cohort perspective, cohort study called the Canadian Alliance for Healthy Hearts and Minds. So really trying to look at air pollution uh, outcomes on the, all those different biological systems that, uh, that Ryan has been mentioning and really using um, state-of-the-art measures such as MRI to uh, to quantify those um, outcomes that we're looking at. And we were surprised at, uh, in, in our study that um, we did not see an association or a consistent association between major pollutants and um, a, an outcome that was called carotid wall vessel uh, volume, which is really um, um, an MRI measure of uh, the thickness at, at, of the carotid uh, wall vessel here that is a proxy for uh, plaque deposition or atherosclerosis. So um, one, um, one, one hypothesis might be that um, these are generally healthy middle-aged adults, so maybe air pollution has more effects on uh, high, people who are at higher risk who already have cardiovascular disease or a later progression of the disease than the early development. So this kind of brings more, I think, the, um, the need for more research to exactly what are the mechanisms that, that are driving those associations that we're consistently seeing. 
And uh, next thing that we're currently researching is uh, the association of air pollutions with cognitive scores. If we can do prospective follow-up, then we can actually look at um, if it's associated with a decline in cognitive scores and then also um, MRI detected outcomes. So lots to be done still. Definitely. Um, yeah, it's it's always fascinating to me how much um, testing and effort, of course, needs to happen in order to establish a, a theory as kind of robust, you know, uh, on how something works or doesn't work uh, on the body. So thanks for providing the insight into the carotid uh, research. I know that the one of the studies I cited in the presentation about short-term effects of wildfire smoke, they was not as robust, probably. They, it, they indexed it to like video game performance in the areas affected by wildfire smoke, which is an interesting one, but I'm looking forward to your study results. Um, Jennifer, uh, what are your thoughts on this? Um, again, I know you have extensive experience in this area, uh, for around, especially around dementia, people living with dementia and dementia care. What surprised you recently um, around air pollution and this topic? Thanks, Leah. I, I think I come at this at a little bit of a different angle uh, than the other panelists, but it's been so interesting to listen. Um, for me, because I really look at how the health system responds to um, and supports people affected by dementia during these events, it's about the reality that preparation is now year round. So I think that even a few years ago, before we had the heat dome here in Vancouver, we would think about climate events as sort of one offs. So let's prepare for this big thing that's going to happen and then maybe don't think about it again. And I think that one of the things that's really happened over the last few years is that the realization, the growing realization that preparation and responses need to be ready to go anytime and that we're always preparing and responding. And we certainly saw that this year around the massive wildfires um, in Eastern Canada and that wildfire smoke traveling. You know, a lot of the media news that I was seeing were people in New York saying, you know, there's smoke here and it's coming from Canada. Um, and so in terms of how the healthcare system responds, there's very little research about supporting people affected by dementia during climate events and wildfires in particular. But one thing we know is that um, we may see greater impacts on the healthcare system during these events. So, for example, people affected by dementia may present at emergency rooms in higher numbers during climate events, particularly once the impacts of poor air quality start to really impact them and affect how they're responding to it. So we need a healthcare system that understands the care needs of people affected by dementia so that healthcare professionals working in the emergency rooms understand what it looks like when someone comes in who might be in a delirium state or might be more responsive uh, because of what's happening to the in their environment. And the other thing um, that I've seen, particularly from my area of practice, which is in long-term care, is that it's really impacted what evacuations look like. So for the past two years in British Columbia, we've seen entire long-term care homes evacuated from the interior down to the lower mainland. This is a huge shift and change. 30 years ago, when I started nursing, um, when we would practice our eva evacuation plan, it meant we went to the park across the street and had a little picnic uh, because we were going to go back into our long term care home after an hour or two. And it was sort of an event and, you know, I don't want to say fun, but it was a fun thing that we could plan around. Um, the amount of planning and work that goes into evacuating across geographic areas using buses or planes is tremendous. And then you are thinking about the person affected by dementia is separated from their family and friends because those people typically don't travel. The staff is going to be different for who's caring. Do you have the spaces in the new place? And so I have come across one study that I think is really important and we need to think about more is um, looking at those impacts. And so looking at things like an increase in medication errors uh, during those types of evacuations, a decrease in mobility um, because people aren't getting mobilized as much, their care plans aren't necessarily being followed as closely. So at the individual level, that can have a huge uh, functional decline impact for that person affected by dementia. So I think 
for our healthcare providers and our healthcare system, we need to be thinking about what do these bigger kinds of evacuations look like? What does it look like when people start presenting more at the emergency room? There might be more demands on inpatient beds, and that's related to these climate events. So for me, those are the things that I really think about um, in terms of what those impacts are and uh, what those kinds of changes are over the last few years. Thanks for that uh, really succinct overview of, of a lot of different dimensions of, of, of crisis response during intense air pollution events, Jennifer. Um, and your point that over the 30 years now, evacuation planning has had to make a huge shift in into the dementia care sector and others. And your point about New York is interesting because uh, even from a planning perspective, I can imagine that, let's say, um, senior care homes or hospitals in New York didn't necessarily probably have like a wildfire smoke uh, response plan in place, right? Like the, I, I suspect, I'm just, I'm just spitballing here, um, but it's something that more and more um, dementia care places need to consider, like you said, year round, not just in the summer or, or you know, wherever um, more expansively than previous. So thanks for that point. And it really leads into our next point. So um, I know myself, like uh, I've, thought about pollution and climate change issues for since the late 80s when I first learned about them as a teen. Um, I know it's a heavy topic, or it is for me sometimes. There's a lot of emotions and actually a whole field of like uh, climate psychology and climate um, emotion work that's out there that we can talk more about another time maybe. But one thing I wanted to end on is, you know, what action can we take uh, collectively or individually? You know, um, that gives us something to do with some of this information and that can be a bit heavy. So what do you think, um, and you mentioned some of this already, Jennifer, but so playing off that, what do you think more governments and healthcare organizations in Canada need to do next about air pollution and dementia or air pollution and health or brain health more generally? Um, like, uh, or have you seen initiatives on this elsewhere that you think should be like expanded? You know, a great idea from where you've seen that you think more places in Canada should do. So um, maybe we'll start with Sandy this time. Um, I know when we chatted uh, last week a little bit in advance, you mentioned like green spaces and urban design among other kinds of things that cities can do. Thank you, Leah. Yeah, I think when uh, when I'm thinking about a question, I feel like I'm not fit to tell governments what to do, but there are <laughs> certain directions I can think of that will be uh, very excited if if these are pursued. And um, so one which, which just coming out of Amanda's uh, uh, previous um, comments are, uh, from a health equity lens is focus on the areas that are more polluted. And if we can, uh, if governments can increase um, cardiovascular disease screening, uh, access to healthcare, then um, because we know cardiovascular disease also is a um, uh, is a risk factor for developing dementia, then uh, you might hit two, two birds with one stone uh, focusing or starting at those areas. And then from a positive uh, note, uh, there is current um, uh, research um, or research calling for uh, that we need to do more research on the effect of green space. And, and there are hypothetical um, mechanisms why green, green space might or exposure to green space might uh, improve or modify uh, the effect of air pollution on cognitive function. And these are like... like Quickly from the literature, just there is a, like a, a harm reduction mechanism that actually vegetation can absorb particulate matter. There is a capacity um, restoring uh, mechanism that when you're um, exposed to to um, green space, your attention is is restored. And then there is a capacity building that green space can increase social interactions, physical activity. So. Um, I think we need to, uh, or governments need to invest more on, as you mentioned, uh, urban design, and and with that also, uh, who who is living in the areas that are mostly populated, no access to green space, uh, and um, sometimes uh, also mostly polluted, uh, polluted areas, and and to add, finding to that list is sometimes it's newcomers. Me myself being like a newer immigrant to Canada, this touches on, um, you know, you're sometimes coming from. Um, countries with much higher exposure levels, and 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 you're already at a higher risk. So, um, where are uh, also uh, people settling here in in Canada? Thanks, Sandy. Um, 
that's really great that there are ways that can positively affect attention and cognition um, in in uh, green space. And also, I love your point about being aware of where people are also coming from and their previous exposure. So thank you so much. Um, who would like to, to go next on this um, in terms of what you'd like to see more governments and healthcare organizations in Canada do next around air pollution and brain health? I'm I'm uh, happy to have it happy to take a stab at it. Um, yeah, I think um, I think uh, in terms of air quality management and in terms of protecting public health, I think forest fires are something of a game changer in terms of the strategies that we're going to have to um, use. Um, you know, someone mentioned, I think maybe Amanda mentioned earlier, the really great success we've had in Canada and other wealthy countries at improving air quality since like the 1970s, when a lot of the air quality legislation uh, came into effect. We've really had tremendous success. And some of that success is now being eroded by um, forest fires. But forest fires are really different in a lot of ways from other sources of air pollution. And, and one of the most important differences is, you know, if you imagine a a factory or a power plant that's emitting um, pollution into the air, we can go to that power plant and put in engineering controls, put in air pollution control technology, or, um, you know, enact legislation to control the emissions from that facility. Whereas with a forest fire, once the fire is burning, you know, obviously forest fires work very courageously to try to put the fire out. But in terms of the smoke emissions, there's not a lot we can do. And because of that, uh, we can't really intervene at the source of the pollution. We have to intervene at the level of individuals and households. And that puts a lot of responsibility on individuals and families to modify their behavior, you know, stay indoors, use air cleaners, potentially use masks, some of the things that you mentioned, Leah, in your uh, introductory um, comments. But I think what I would like to see is a really coordinated effort from all levels of government, the healthcare system, public health agencies, and the public sort of all working together to try to mitigate the risk. So certainly individuals, um, there are things that individuals and families can do, um, but governments also have a really important role to play. So just telling people to use an air cleaner uh, may not get the job done because some people may not be able to afford, afford to buy an air cleaner, or some people may not have stable housing. Um, you know, so telling someone who doesn't have stable housing to stay indoors isn't very um, good advice. So I think governments have a role to play in terms of doing things like, um, you know, good, clear, uh, effective communication, um, continuing to develop tools to tell the public when and where the smoke is likely to be, um, setting up clean air shelters, um, places that where people can go um, to to get a get a break from the smoke. Um, and then also thinking about heat. Jennifer talked a little bit about heat in her comments. Um, that's something that we're going to have to sort of manage along with the smoke is because, you know, obviously the, the smoke tends to come often during periods of intense heat as well. So um, there are a lot of challenges here. And I think really, as I said, forest fires are kind of a game changer and are going to force us to change the way we think and change the way we um, kind of act um, to protect the public from the health effects of air pollution. Thank you very much. Um, definitely a game changer. Yes. Um, Jennifer, uh, how about you go next and then Amanda can can uh, do the wrap up. Um, anchor leg. Uh, what are your thoughts? I, I know you are you do have so many recommendations in your work and I will share that when we post the video to make sure that everybody's research is linked to. Um, but what are your thoughts right now on um, what governments and healthcare organizations can do? I'll just really follow up enthusiastically on what Ryan's talked about. I think real recognition that this is intersectoral and multi-layer government work to be done. So we need people from uh, many different types of disciplines and sectors, but also the municipal or local government, provincial, territorial, and the federal government working in sync on this. I think that when, um, to use the example of the heat dome in Vancouver, uh, we had a lot of responses at the community and neighborhood level, and then at the municipal level, and then it was like, what's what else, right? Like, who is responsible during these events um, and ongoing for these different impacts and aspects of issues related to air pollution and wildfires? So I think that's starting to happen, and I think that um, we need to continue to see the silos broken down around, you know, who is, there's not just one one place responsible. So increasingly, we're seeing um, 
actual jobs posted are related to climate change and sustainability in the healthcare system and in government. And we need to continue to see those things. And just to bring it back to dementia care, we also need to see inclusion of um, representatives from our community of dementia care at those tables and being consulted or having people with expertise in that area in those positions, because we really need to recognition around how do we support this population? And there are some unique aspects, I think. Um, and so even though we've seen a lot of work done around um, responding to climate events over even the past year or two, you know, how do we customize those now? How do we tailor them to the dementia community? And I think there are things that we can do and they aren't quite happening yet. And so just continuing the conversation, continuing to bring it up and raise it, advocate with people in key roles. I think that's a really important piece of it as well. So I'll leave it at that for now. Great, thanks, Jennifer. Um, and Amanda, I know when we got to chat a little bit last week, you mentioned there was a social prescribing thing that, that you found a bit hopeful. Um, uh, but I'll let you, you're better at explaining it, you're the expert, so please proceed. Sure, I um, just wanna build on everything that everyone's already said before. I think a promising recent development is actually just earlier this month, the government of Canada recognized that all Canadians have a right to a healthy environment in legislation through changes to the Canadian Environmental Protection Act. And here, when we say healthy environment, it's not just healthy ecosystems, but also healthy, healthy environments for healthy people. Um, and I think there's a lot of hope that this change is actually going to create some policy and funding opportunities to reduce air pollution and advance environmental justice. So to build on the points that came before, um, hopefully this means really trying to target interventions towards vulnerable communities, whether that's on like an infrastructural level, like um, thinking about where we're increasing green space, or I work with some health authorities who are very attentive to the siting of long-term care facilities and supportive housing, um, given air pollution sources, um, to some of those um, adaptation measures that we just heard, right? Like making sure that people are aware of the impacts of um, health um, of, of air pollution, particularly, for instance, older adults or elderly populations in the context of these wildfire events. Um, wh what you mentioned was that, um, you know, can we target, can we increase access to uh, adaptive technologies like air cleaners? So, for instance, um, uh, subsidizing them for lower income households or those with health conditions, or, you know, you might think of that as uh, you said social prescribing, like, can your doctor prescribe this for you uh, because of your, um, um, you know, enhanced vulnerability. Uh, and then to link to something that Ryan said, a big part of this too is also addressing some of the systemic drivers of health disparities. Um, as he said, if someone's experiencing homelessness, you can't just say, go indoors to reduce your exposure rate. So that really says that we do have to tackle some of these big systemic drivers. Um, one of those I think is also climate change, of course, you know, when we're talking about wildfires. Um, and so that means that recognizing that there are important links between government climate action and then also um, health protective action. Um, and uh, yeah, so looking for those opportunities to link um, health policy and environmental policy. That's a really great point um, for our group conversation to end on that environmental policy is, is also in many ways health, even health policy, right? It's, it's not, they're not separate things just happening separately. Um, thank you, Amanda. And thank you all our panelists um, for sharing your expertise. Uh, um, I am uh, going to go to our Q&A. Um, we've got a great question here from Rebecca williams Collin. What are your tips for talking to people who are skeptical on the effect of air pollution uh, in a productive way? So what are some tips for talking in a productive way to people who are skeptical? Skeptical. That's a, that's a great question. So who would like to go first with that answer? I know it's okay. I, I, I can, I can okay. ju jump in. Um, so I, um, you know, my job is, is to study air pollution and I have, but I still have friends and family members who kind of think it's all a big uh, hoax or something. Um, and, you know, one of the points I'll make to them is that um, very few people now doubt that cigarette smoke um, adversely affects health, right? So the idea that you can inhale um, cigarette smoke into your lungs and it would cause health effects, very few people would be um, skeptical of that science or that evidence. 
And really, a lot of the stuff we're talking about today is not all that different from the stuff that's coming out of the end of a cigarette. For example, cigarettes produce huge amounts of, of fine particulate matter. You mentioned, Leah, in your introduction, PM 2.5 or, or fine particulate matter. Um, now, now, cigarette smoke contains a lot of other things, you know, nicotine and other things that aren't in ambient air pollution. But really, I tend to sort of a first pass, I tend to think of um, ambient air pollution or the stuff that's kind of out in the air that we're breathing every day. As, as sort of not all that different from just diluted um, cigarette smoke. Um, so that sometimes is is one way that you can kind of initiate that conversation with people who might be skeptical is to take something that maybe they're more uh, familiar with or, or or more willing to acknowledge as a threat to health and sort of using that as a, as a bridge um, to um, begin to talk about uh, other types of air pollution. Thanks, Ryan. Um... A good tip. Um, any any anybody else have tips for for this particular challenge? Um, perhaps just to add, maybe also uh, when when speaking, um, like to embrace the uncertainty in the literature. There are again um, things that were the evidence shows that we're we're very sure of this outcome. Things that we're still researching and. Uh, and I guess just the attitude of, you know, someone who wants to reach another person that, okay, we're looking at this together or we're, um, uh, we're, um, we're, we're kind of um, fine picking what is more important to focus on than other outcomes. So that kind of approach instead of like uh, an attack might, might help in, uh, in conversations. Right. That's a really good point too. Thanks, Sandy. Yeah. Um... Trying to like yeah understand see to acknowledge there is some there are some uncertainties in the research and there's things that are more certain so and looking at it together kind of empathetically amazing um, anybody else want to share any resources or tips or we also have another question we can we can look to and there's also another poll that's popped up for our audience so if our audience has time to answer that please do um, I'll just add like something to the communication okay. question. So, you know, I, I've been studying air pollution for, um, you know, a, a decade and more now. Um, but, it, and so I, I was aware of, of, you know, air pollution health impacts, but uh, I actually, um, adult onset asthma. <laughs> and so, you know, even though I was studying it, when I personally became just much more sensitive, it's like, oh my gosh, like I could feel the changes in the air in my body in ways that even though I knew conceptually, cause I had been studying this, um, felt really different. And so I think maybe one thing too, is maybe um, amplifying the, the um, uh, you know, hearing more from people who are sensitive. And I think for, you know, I have friends who are asking me like, should I go out for a run during a wildfire? Then I'm like, you really should not. I know you, you might not feel like you're feeling it right now, um, but, um, you know, uh, listen to some of the people who are very sensitive instruments <laughs> to that. And, um, you know, the research does show that even if you're not feeling it right now, it is having these sorts of impacts. So um, even for someone who studies it, it was, it was different when it was an embodied experience for me. Right. Yeah, sharing personal stories can often be a way to, to share information too, um, for people who are maybe less familiar with data. Um, even very familiar, like you said yourself. Um, so thank you all for that. Um, if since we're running low on time, is it okay, Jennifer, if we go to the next question or would you like to provide a response? Okay, thank you very much. Um, thank you uh, very much, Rebecca, for that question. Annalise, we'll just try and do a quick response to this um, before we leave. What about the effects of indoor air pollution, such as use of the breeze and other air fresheners that are chemicals, for example? Um, we do not know the effects of these chemicals on the brain and it needs research. So any thoughts on that? We talked a lot about external sources of air pollution, but less on chemicals in the home per se. Thoughts on that? If people are concerned about indoor products like that? Um, I'll, I'll do a quick comment on this just because actually I have some odor related research and this often comes up about, yeah, like air that smells nice isn't always necessarily um, cleaner. Um, some of the things that, you know, uh, like are odor masking, they actually lead to more indoor air um, air pollution. And so uh, there is a difference between like um, nice smelling air and then air that has lower um, lower concentrations of air pollution. So when we talk about air cleaners, um, you know, um, we're hoping for things like filters that are actually like removing um, some of those uh, uh, um, air contaminant 
contaminants. But I, I have definitely come across uh, um, that issue as, as something that, to, to talk through with people in my family okay. as well. Um, I'll, I'll just add, um, there's not anything I'm aware of in terms of, of, of brain health, but I know that in, in the literature, there is some evidence that long-term kind of chronic exposure to cleaning products. Um, and this is particularly studies, I think, among people who are um, uh, cleaning uh, homes for a living. Um, so, you know, hours and hours every day exposure to these products. Um, there's some evidence of associations between long-term exposure to those cleaning products and some uh, respiratory um, morbidity, um, sort of asthma triggering um, and allergy development and those kinds of outcomes. So I think there is at least some evidence um, that, that um, you know, cleaning once or something is unlikely to have any effect, but chronic exposure, there may be some associations there. Thank you. Um, that's all the time we have for today. I will follow up with any other uh, questions later on via email with our team. Um, thank you all so much panelists for sharing your in-depth insights with us. Just so valuable. I really appreciate it. Um, thank you audience for your questions, for being here, for your interest. Um, join us next time, November 22nd at 12 Eastern, when journalist Sadaf Hassan will be moderating a panel on South Asian experiences of dementia in Canada. And there's more info on that at alzheimer.ca slash November talk. This session today will be posted to our website and YouTube in the coming days, and we'll send an email notice when that's available. Any feedback, questions, suggestions, please send them to publications at alzheimer.ca. Thank you all so much for joining panelists and audience, and I hope you all have a great day.